hello everyone and uh, we know this is one of the last sessions you're probably going to be attending here <laughs> Um, I am Divya Mohan, and I'm working as a principal technology advocate at SUSE, one of the co-chairs for the Kubernetes SIG docs. Uh, and I have with me Ray here. We'll introduce ourselves in a bit, but uh, we're co-chairs for the Kubernetes documentation. And we also have one of our other co-chairs right here taking our photos. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we help with maintaining the <clears throat> Kubernetes documentation. and. We are here to shed some light on how you could potentially document your career with SigDocs. And uh, like I said, uh, we will introduce ourselves. Um, I already did. Uh, so uh, in addition to being a SigDocs co-chair, I'm also just a CNCF ambassador. And um, with that, I think I want to hand it over to Ray. Hey, folks. My name is Ray Lahano. I'm a solutions architect at Red Hat. Uh, also, as Divya mentioned, I'm a SigDocs co-chair. I'm also a SIG security sub-project lead as well. And I'm also a CNCF ambassador. And I've uh, been involved with the release team, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk as well. Yeah, we have a lot of fun nuggets for you folks uh, from the various sides of the project that we've worked with. Uh, but why are we talking about this today? Uh, the reason is that... Uh, Contributing to docs and contributing to open source in general, as you might or might not have noticed, could often be a thankless job. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it can be confusing more than con uh, thankless because when you start taking your first steps into open source contribution or even contributing to documentation, that is just probably everyone's first step here, it can be confusing. Uh, we also have this, um, I think there's, there's this whole uh, thing of getting involved in open source that um, you know a lot of people are confused about and they don't seem to know how to do it. So we want to um, guide you through it with this talk, especially if you're talking in the context of uh, documentation and specific to the context of Kubernetes documentation. And uh, if you've been around on YouTube, uh, or TikTok or Twitter or LinkedIn, you would have probably noticed that um, open source has sort of become a gamified model of how to get a job with open source. Uh, make your first contribution uh, into an open source project and get a job. And uh, that doesn't really set a good precedent because as much as we all want for everyone to have food on their table, uh, we also want for community health and sustainability to be maintained so that future generations of open source and uh, you know communities can grow and build um, technologies around them. And uh, when I started out, uh, one of the main reasons behind the talk is that when I started out, nobody talk to me about overcommitting. Nobody talked to me about the potential pitfalls of overcommitting and how it can quickly spiral into burnout. Side note, and not definitely a plug, I also have talked about burnout at another KubeCon. And uh, honestly speaking, another thing is also that uh, we are very varied from where we come in. Uh, I come from India, Ray here comes from uh, San Francisco, which is in the US, and uh, Natalie is from Germany, and we have contributors from every part of the globe, including Australia, New Zealand, and I don't think we have any from the Arctic regions yet, but we're working on it, I promise you. Uh, <laughs> but essentially, all these different backgrounds mean we have a lot of folks we need to uh, take into account a lot of perspectives and sometimes doing that when you're contributing can be very difficult even as a contributor when you engage with all these different backgrounds they it can get difficult to channel uh, it can get difficult to channel all their feedback all their perspectives and make an efficient contribution so we want to guide you on how to do that in the best possible way so what are we going to talk about today so uh, first up, we're going to talk about how you can find your niche when contributing to open source documentation, specific again to the Kubernetes documentation, because this is a maintainer track. <laughs> the second thing that we're going to talk about is uh, 
how to get started the right way, building the foundation for a successful contribution to Doc's journey. Uh, we want to be able to empower you to continue your open source journey, uh, not just within the Kubernetes project, but outside of it as well. And we're gonna show and tell, because basically both of us have actually gone through this journey, as I'm sure has Natalie and a lot of our other tech leads as well. So we wanna be able to um, actually convey that through a show and tell exercise that we've designed for you. And uh, again, talking about uh, overcommitting and burnout, um, we want to warn you all that it's a sprint and not a marathon. And although we do not have specific slides for this, uh, we are going to delve into the burnout bits a little bit from the maintainers as well as the contributor perspective. Last but not the least, I think uh, positioning is a very, 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 very important uh, thing to consider. Uh, because irrespective of wherever you are, uh, open source, outside of open source, even if you're not in the tech industry, you need to position yourself correctly. Uh, you need to position uh, your product correctly. You need to position something that you're delivering correctly so that you are able to reap the maximum benefits of whatever you're do doing. And uh, with our journey, uh, we want to help you um, see how you can do that over time with contributing to docs in the open source ecosystem and again, specific to the Kubernetes project. Now I've I realize that I've been talking for quite a while, so I'm gonna hand it over to Ray. <laughs> All right, just a little summary on what SigDocs does and what we are responsible for. SigDocs is one of the many uh, special interest groups for, of the Kubernetes project, and we are responsible for documentation. With that, we are the documentation is on kubernetes.io, so uh, there's one of our sub-projects, is the website that also involves all the, the whole entire tech stack for our website, which is Yugo, Netlify, uh, other things that we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Another sub-project, which is part of Docs, is maintaining the blogs as well. So, and third uh, sub-project is reference docs. So if you ever use uh, reference docs for Kube Control or uh, the Kube APIs as well, we actually have to manage the tooling involved on how to generate those reference docs. Uh, lastly, we have the localization subproject, which currently we have 15 uh, languages that the Kubernetes docs is translated into. And we're working on several more as well. So a little bit about me and my open source journey and how I'm here on stage and I'm also on a co-chair of Stig Docs. So this is my open source journey. I've been in closed source for about, for over 10 years before this. So I started off with a very small company, but it's actually a CNCF member, it's RxM. So through RxM, uh, we were able to, um, they, they, I was able to pass the CK and the CCAD got lots of experience with Kubernetes. And they also had a philosophy of Open Source Fridays. So Open Source Fridays is where they give you Fridays uh, during your work week uh, to work on open source. It's not always the case because some things happen at work, but if you're free, Open Source Fridays uh, allowed or allowed me to work on open source. They also encouraged me a lot to, or us a lot to uh, join CNCF uh, TAG or, or SIG meetings. So back then it was called a SIG. So I actually started joining the CNCF uh, or SIG security, but it was actually called SIG before TAG. Uh, so with, with SIG security, I was, very new to the CNCF landscape, so I started joining the meetings. I was uh, I was a note taker for quite a bit. I just raised my hand and volunteered to take notes. Excuse me. <laughs> Easy. Then. With that, um, taking notes actually helped me a lot to actually remember the content, remember all these projects. So if anyone wants to uh, help and start out, note taking is a great uh, place to just start. Just join a meeting and start. And everyone, we always need note takers as well. So uh, after the, with that, I wanted to join another uh, SIG at that time. Now it's called a tag. It was runtime. It was actually, I think I joined one of the very first several meetings of uh, SIG runtime at that time. Now it's tag runtime. Uh, that didn't really stick with me. So I, did, so I kind of sticked with, uh, with CNCF tag security. Uh, then I went to SIG docs. I uh, loved SIG docs as well. That was about the same time I was still with RxM. And I love the people in SIG docs in the meetings. So uh, it was back when uh, Zach was the, was the co-chair of SIG Docs, 
and he was very, uh, he, we had a very welcoming environment, or we, do, we have one. Um, and with that, I stuck around quite a bit with SIG Docs. It took me quite a while to actually make my first contribution, because it is daunting. It's a very big uh, project. Uh, it's a very big repo as well. So it took, me, it took me at least six months to actually start contributing to SIG Docs. Uh, at, shortly after that, I was able to join the release team in 1.18. Uh, uh, I was actually a release notes uh, shadow, and that was a great experience. I actually met uh, pretty much lifelong friends now. So there's three of us on that same uh, shadow sub team that we, we that we we actually remained in in the Kubernetes project. Um, we did our own thing, but we always remained friends. Um, Next, I stayed around with seven release teams, and I became a release lead for 1.23. At this time, I moved over to Rancher Labs. Uh, because it, with my experience with Kubernetes, uh, having, having my CKA, CCAD, also being, you know, uh, contributing to Kubernetes as well, um, it, was a it was a natural move to go to Rancher Labs. And with Rancher Labs, I was, which was acquired by SUSE, I moved over to SUSE. So, uh, with that, uh, during my time at Ranch Labs, I became the release lead for 1.23. Then I was the emeritus advisor for 1.25. So I was a total of about uh, seven. I was seven releases. I was uh, seven release teams. I was a member of. Uh, so after that, I was a Sig Docs co-chair. I was actually approached to be the uh, the co-chair for Sig Docs, but I was at the same time I was release lead. I was like. Let's wait after, after the release cycle. <laughs> uh, so Sig Docs co-chair. At this time, I've been a reviewer for Sig Docs and improver for Sig Docs for a while. And I've also been a member of many or several release team docs team as well, and also been a docs lead as well. So at this time, I was very familiar uh, with Sig Docs. So it was natural uh, pro progression with the contributor ladder that we'll talk about later to go to approver uh, status and then, and then co-chair. Uh, I also dabble a little bit in SIG, SIG ContribX. I attended meetings for the Contributor Comms, uh, helped out uh, bridge the gap because Contributor Comms also published blogs on Kubernetes.io. So I was kind of helped to, I wanted to bridge a gap between uh, SIG ContribX that, that published blogs on spot, SIG Spotlights with Kubernetes SIG Docs, and also volunteer as well for you to manage events with the, with the, uh, contrib with the Contributor Summits. I also dabbled in, I started to go into SIG security because uh, a friend of mine, um, Savita, who, is, uh, who leads this, this uh, SIG security uh, docs sub projects, uh, asked me to join uh, because it also ties in with being a docs approver as well. So I started joining uh, that sub project meeting and then joining the SIG security meeting as well. Uh, so, I, so, uh, so I found a, another home with SIG security. That led to being, uh, joining the third-party uh, audit subproject and eventually becoming a lead or and currently the lead for the third-party uh, audit subproject, which is a subproject that coordinates um, regular third-party security audits for the Kubernetes project. Uh, and I also, uh, meantime, I also moved to Red Hat recently as well, so that also helped as well because um, I knew the projects very intimately. I knew it in different uh, verticals or different uh, aspects of the project from docs, from release. Um, I also, uh, I don't want to say what I help, but I help make some bridges. Part of the Kubernetes release, we, uh, they actually moved the dev and RPM builds to, uh, to OBS, which is managed by OpenSUSE. So I helped with some, just some of the comms. Uh, with that. Um, then I became moved over to Red Hat, and now I'm a CNCF ambassador. Uh, and I highlighted the stars here to show what kind of stuck with me, with my, my niche. So even though I tried different aspects of the Kubernetes project and even the CNCF uh, landscape with other CNCF tags as well, I want to highlight just the four uh, uh, areas that stuck with me that I found a home with and that became my, my niche in, with the Kubernetes project. So there's reasons why I contribute to docs, and this is kind of became my uh, saying here was that good documentation drives uh, the adoption of open source projects. Uh, this came about because my first, my very first experience with Kubernetes was with was with a closed so uh, closed source software that was installed on Kubernetes, but didn't tell you that it was on, on Kubernetes installed with an ISO. So I found out later there was etcd errors. I was like, what's etcd? <laughs> so, <laughs> 
So, uh, so it's really stuck with me on how good documentation drives uh, the adoption of open source projects. Also with my involvement with the release team, and especially with the docs team, which still has a special place in my heart. So with the Kubernetes release team, uh, it's, there's a new team for every single release, so there's three teams a year. So there, so there is a big change with the release team, and there's a lot of tacit knowledge involved, which is documented, so I don't wanna call it tacit knowledge, but there's knowledge involved that, uh, that's helpful if you've been involved before. So I do like to help out the release uh, docs teams uh, for each cycle as well. There's also like special access that they might need to Netlify where the Kubernetes projects is actually hosted on. Um, also, that also keeps me updated. So part of the Kubernetes release team and the docs team is to uh, make sure that all the new and updated enhancements or features in the next release is properly documented. So if I'm very familiar with that, with that team and I review those docs, that means I'm familiar with the new and updated features uh, for, the, for the next version of Kubernetes, which helps me in my job because my day job is OpenShift, which is a Kubernetes distribution. So that's my, uh, so what, what I ask you is to find what drives you. So everyone is different, everyone's story is different as well. I found my home in different places, but I tried many things within the Kubernetes and CNCF landscape. So I'm going to take over for a little bit and talk about my uh, journey here. So I uh, started out from the other side of the coin where I basically did not have a lot of open source experience, did not work in the open source landscape at all, was a consumer of open source projects in general um, at my workplace, but was not a contributor, um, did not know about anything in the open source landscape. I worked with HSBC back then. Uh, my first introduction to Kubernetes was, again, uh, not a surprise. Uh, it was with Sig Docs. Uh, it, um, and I was a non-member contributor. Basically, there's a distinction that we make uh, wherein contributors, um, after, you know, a, after sustaining their contributions for a while, are made members of the organization. So for a long time, uh, around two, three months, um, I was a non-member contributor, mostly a non-member lurker, not even a contributor, to be honest, because I literally attended meetings and I stayed quiet through most of them because I was intimidated, daunted, and I didn't know what to speak. Uh, it was a very uh, weird space for me because I also was very new to the ecosystem. So um, somehow I uh, ended up seeing this notification for uh, um, a SIG release shadow program. I did not even understand what it was about, but I was like, oh, there's something to do with docs in it. Maybe just try applying for it. And that's how I ended up, uh, you know, uh, being a shadow on the doc side of things and then moving on to the comms bit. Uh, so we have different verticals within the release team itself that churns out um, uh, you know, your Kubernetes versions every quarter. So basically I ended up uh, doing the shadowing for these two verticals. And after that, uh, I took a strange pivot, which I have no idea why I did, but I did. And uh, I ended up um, doing the Google season of docs with Son. Uh, but the fun fact here is that I actually applied to do it with the Kubernetes project. And uh, Sarah, at that point, who was leading the uh, Kubernetes project is like, you're not a technical writer. So uh, you need experience. And we are looking for experienced technical writers in the project. And uh, that's that's actually great advice, uh, which I shall actually get to in a bit. Because as a, a project, we were looking out for more experienced contributors. And as, a, as a, an applicant, I was like, hey, since I'm already in the project, might as well try and apply and see if, it, if I can make it. Maybe I can make it because I'm already, you know, lurking and people know me. But that didn't work out. So I applied to CERN and uh, got through, helped revamp their Rusio documentation. And uh, um, in the meantime, because of the contributions that I had been making to the ecosystem as part of SIG Docs and SIG Release, um, I was recognized as a CNCF ambassador. This was also coincidentally when the pandemic started. And that's why I had a lot of time. And I uh, sort of didn't pace myself after this at all because 
after getting that heady title of being a C CNCF ambassador, I went on to also lead the comms uh, for uh, the next release, which was version 1.21. And uh, Savita, who's again my friend too, <laughs> she <laughs> she asked me to be the release lead shadow underneath uh, underneath her um, you know leadership for the 1.22 release. Um, as it turns out, um, after that, I realized that I had done too much work and I was suffering from burnout. I did not pace myself well. Um, and uh, it took me around, I think, six to eight months to fully recover from it. And uh, also realized that I was probably not going to do very well when I had a full-time job and an open source, uh, uh, you know, contributor uh, thingy at the side to manage. So as I decided to pivot to a more full-time role, and um, luckily for me, uh, there was a co-chair position open, um, and I applied for it, and we went through a cohort, all three of us, uh, wherein we were um, prepped, so to say, about the expectations of the role, um, expectations of the people who assumed the role, about what the technicalities of the role were, and uh, I also underwent another cohort uh, wherein there was a uh, whole focus on what SIG, leader SIG leadership looks like. So there was a lot of prep work involved. And uh, I became co-chair at around the same time that I moved to uh, SUSA slash Rancho, however you choose to call it, but uh, SUSA as it is now. And um, I was a technical writer there. And uh, now uh, I'm also working alongside uh, C uh, CNCF stack contributor strategy to um, help further the non-code initiative um, as a member, uh, primarily because uh, I've realized that for people coming in from very diverse backgrounds and not necessarily an engineering background, uh, even documentation might seem like a large step to take. Uh, primarily because, again, uh, our documentation is all based on GitHub, and not a lot of people know Git. Not a lot of people are familiar with Markdown if you are actually contributing to tech. Um, they do want to be able to contribute to tech in ways that are meaningful for them and ways that actually give them a seat at the table. So um, I got involved and we are actually having, I think, fortnightly meetings, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so fortnightly meetings uh, for this initiative and uh, we'd be thrilled if you join in. Um, another thing that I also got involved um, you can see that there's a trend here that I tend to overcome it. But um, another thing that I also got involved with is the uh, leading of uh, the Chaos Asia initiative, uh, primarily because uh, this is a trend that I've noticed uh, across the open source ecosystem. Not to blame anyone here, but it's also a trend that I've noticed that uh, uh, is, there's very less Asian representation. And uh, coming from India, there's, we've done a better job of it over the past couple of years, but there's still a very, very, very long way to go. So um, that's, that's one of the things that I want to better, and I want to help develop metrics around. So that's, that's, that's why, you know, for me, this all looks like a very, um, you know, great thing to retrospect on, and it all fits together perfectly standing here right now. But when I was going through the process, this was like hitting uh, darts blindfolded. It was not making any sense as to why I was doing it. But the thing is, I was trying out different things to see where I fit. And that's that's what we're trying to drive here. Like Ray's journey and my journey are completely different. We come from very different parts of the world, have very different backgrounds. Um, and the whole point of it is to try new things because open source gives you that opportunity to do it. Um, the CNCF ecosystem, in fact, gives you more opportunities than most ecosystems to do it because um, there's not only um, initiatives for you to develop software, to develop code, but there's also ways that you can get involved uh, that make it more meaningful for you to contribute if you're not a code contributor. But uh, um, again, the stars are all Ray's edition. I'm not good with graphics. These these were like uh, Ray's editions of animations. But uh, essentially, why I contribute is the primary reason is I'm a very uh, I'd like to say that I learn by reading. I first have to read documentation and then I try out stuff. I know that's the reverse of what a lot of people do, and um, I might be in the minority. 
but I like reading good documentation. And this also probably comes from my experience of having been in production support and systems engineering for around 10 years before I got into the open source ecosystem. Because um, if you've ever been on, a, on an outage call, you know that maintaining good system documentation, good, good architectural documentation is absolutely critical. And uh, the amount of times that I've been on a production call and I have not had that documentation has traumatized me to actually pursue a career in that path. So that's my reason, the primary and the only reason that I would have thought of. But uh, I'm also obviously going to copy the fact that uh, Ray just said that adoption bit, because I think that's a very good phrase, that it drives adoption. Uh, that's a very good reason, but my primary reason is still going to be the fact that uh, years of production support have given me trauma. And this is my way of uh, offloading it on everyone else. Uh, <laughs> And um, last but not the least, uh, the second point again is around uh, bringing in diverse perspectives. I'm very passionate about that because I don't see a lot of representation where I go. Um, and being in an open source ecosystem and having the um, little influence that I do um, is the way that I believe I can help build communities that are more inclusive and more representative of the uh, world that we live in. Um, so contributing to docs is often a first step for a lot of contributors um, because it's the first easy step. Make a typo, uh, make a typo uh, edit better. Uh, make a typo, uh, you know, make, uh, make some diagram changes or uh, reframe a sentence, help other contributors understand it better. So it's easy to get started. But like I also said, there are hurdles like uh, technology specifically Git that a lot of people don't understand. And that's another thing that we're trying to address. But by doing so, I'm able to welcome, along with my co-chairs and the entire community, of course, uh, more people into the space. And uh, that's sort of what drives me when it comes to open source documentation. And that's also what I'd probably give you as advice, although I'm the worst person at giving advice. Uh, find what drives you. Hmm. And I should probably also hand it over to Ray. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, um, I've had lots of positive impact from open source con uh, contributions. One is really knowing the docs helps me ace all the Kubernetes technical interviews I've, I've ever had because they ask about a specific thing and, like, I've edited that page. I know exactly what they're talking <laughs> about. I got this. So I'm very worried about any technical interviews about Kubernetes because most likely I've seen that page before. I may have edited, may have reviewed it, but I've at least touched that page, probably have used it as well in the past. So with that, um, so, so obviously once we know the docs, you could ace the technical portions of any, of any interviews. Also, when you do make contributions, the community feels your, your contributions. You don't have to, you know, tell anyone, oh, I've done this, this PR. People know already that you've contributed to the project. People feel it. With that, that kind of, that leads to named roles. So you could be a reviewer, approver, subproject lead, tech lead, co-chair, and that might be something you might put on your resume and that might help you in, in your future endeavors. Also contributing also helps with dev stats. I'm not saying to gamify it, but dev stats helps you justify your time with the project to your employer. Dev stats also helps your employer as well. Your contributions helps your employer. So there's uh, many reasons. Uh, so I want to go over some reasons on how to start the right way. Uh, first thing is to uh, join the Kubernetes Slack. So we all communicate uh, async in Slack. Uh, a second one is join uh, the SIG Slack channel. There's many SIGs out there, but this is for SIG docs. So please join the SIG docs or SIG security Slack channel if you're involved, <laughs> if you're interested in, in security. Um, read the contribution guide. So uh, one thing I like to say is do your homework. So read the contribution guide. Uh, we uh, read the README for the SIG, read the uh, charter for the SIG, read the contributing.md for the SIG. Uh, not all SIGs have a specific one. Uh, not all SIGs have a specific contributing.md. We have one for SIG docs, and we have a, a high-level one for the Kubernetes projects as well. Uh, also join the SIGs mailing list. The easiest way and the only way to get the calendar invites for the meetings is to join the mailing list. Uh, attend the meetings, and like I said, if you want to, 
uh, volunteered to be note taker. When I first joined CNCF, tag security. I knew nothing of Spiffy Inspire, but I actually took uh, so many notes about Spiffy Inspire when they presented. I know Spiffy Inspire now. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, so definitely volunteer to help notes. Uh, we need it in SIG Docs. We need, uh, we need it in any SIG meeting like SIG, SIG security as well. It's a great help. Uh, watch, we have many videos on YouTube from the scene staff. We have uh, four, four SIG Docs. So there's a great uh, intro to Kubernetes Docs on YouTube, and we have many uh, videos on SIG Docs on YouTube as well. Uh, we, as a SIG, have a uh, monthly new contributor meet and greet as well, so you could join that. We have a new con new meet, I'm sorry, we have a new contributor ambassador as well, so we have someone, uh, it's a name role to help you uh, to actually make contributions to, the, to SIG Docs. And there's a great talk by Divya and Bill Mulligan on the 10 biggest mistakes you shouldn't make in open source as well. So that was delivered in 2022. I uh, highlighted or I linked that video as well in the slide deck. As you can see, I'm a very talkative person. <laughs> so. so this, uh, so one point, I, so I call this my uh, it's inspired mentorship. So uh, Dims, if you're not uh, uh, familiar with Dims, he uh, is a major contributor to the project as well. But uh, so I say that Dims is my inspired mentor, meaning I don't have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with Dims. His work, his uh, his messages, his contributions inspires me. So um, and he uh, so that's what I say is like instead of um, we can, all of us as maintainers can't scale ourselves, but our work. Uh, but to, you could take inspiration from other maintainers as well as I do. I take inspiration from Divya, take inspiration from Natalie, another uh, SigDocs co-chair, and also uh, Ian Tabby are here, our Sig security co-chair as well. I take inspiration and mentorship from them, even though they're not. You know, we're not. It's not a one-on-one -on -one mentorship, but I take I take mentorship from them. Uh, Dims also has a great resource. It's uh, GitHub just on Kubernetes resources on how to uh, like beginner developer uh, resources on Kubernetes as well. So I made those in the link. Also, some uh, healthy open source habits is of course uh, attend meetings. You'll meet uh, friends. That's the the model here. Uh, work with others. You'll make friends. Uh, go to events. You make friends. Uh, volunteer and do the work. You'll make friends. And other tips is start small. Don't jump into K, KK or Kubernetes slash Kubernetes and don't make, you know, you don't have to make a big uh, code contribution. Start small. Um, and it's also okay to be, to feel intimidated because I did for a very long time. And also I had imposter syndrome because I had, I made a few PRs. I have this org membership, but I didn't really feel like I belong, which is fine. And people learn along the way. And uh, like I said, and people will help you as well when you uh, bump in, uh, have run into any um, road bumps as well. Uh, people will, will reach out and help you. And uh, reach, look also for issues. Uh, we have a good first issue uh, label. So if you're looking for uh, uh, places to get started with, uh, we, if you look at our issues, we have a good first issues label that you can filter. It's also, it's, it's okay to take a break. So, you know, uh, ourselves, uh, you know, I could speak for myself where I say yes to many things, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I should stop, but it's okay to take a break. And we have, and we've made, I made great friends here, uh, my fellow co-chairs that, you know, we always back each other up as well. So it's uh, great to take a break and it's okay because there's other folks that will help you, you know, when you do take a break. All right, so now we come to the part of the presentation where I spoke about being a non-contributor member, I guess, yes, non-contributor member, or a non-member contributor, sorry. Uh, it's 4 p.m., I've not had my coffee, I'm really sorry about this, but uh, uh, essentially you start off uh, in any open source project as a non-member contributor. Now, what does that mean is um, you actually have to do the work before you get the role assigned to you. And I know this sounds um, like a tedious job, but trust me, when you have friends along the way, it becomes a little easy. And uh, everybody starts right at the bottom. Nobody starts at the top. Um, and uh, in the Kubernetes project, we have this clearly outlined in our contributor ladder, wherein we start off as non-member non contributors. All of us here 
who are members, who are coaches, have started at the bottom. We then uh, gain trust. We then gain the um, you know recognition of being members of the organization through sponsorship um, by another member of the organization. So it works um, in the way that you have to continue and uh, give or uh, not give rather you you have to continue uh, and uh, you know contribute in such a way that it is sustained um, through, a, uh, through a particular period of time uh, and uh, you can ask for sponsorship uh, once you have actually a minimum number of contributions uh, and we are able to recognize you through that and uh, not just SIG leads but any Kubernetes member is actually um, allowed to sponsor you for this. Uh, once you, uh, you know, become a member, you end up also having, um, you know, other responsibilities as well. Uh, because now you want to know what's next. Uh, you want to understand where to go to. Uh, there's, there's, there needs to be a next, right? Like, uh, even if you're working, uh, you need to know where you're off to next before you even start the current job. Uh, so, uh, essentially, after a member, you uh, can become a reviewer or you can jump to another area of the project and continue your contributions there. It's up to you. But if you want to level up in the area that you're working in, being a reviewer, being an approver is a good choice to go through. And then... Uh, of course, there are sub-project leads and co-chairs and tech leads that are slightly elevated in terms of privileges because they are basically the ones dealing with the admin uh, layer of abstraction that no contributor or member have to go through. Uh, we ensure that the uh, communities that we build around the area of the project are healthy enough for people to uh, exist in. It's not uh, violating the codes of conduct that have been outlined by the parent organization, in this case, it's CNCF. And uh, we also ensure that people have an avenue to contribute to, um, whether it's newer contributors, whether it's, um, you know, significantly more <laughs> older contributors. We, uh, we have to ensure that that healthiness and the stability of the project area that we are responsible for, that's maintained. So we have several people who are responsible for that as sub-project sub leads and co-chairs and tech leads. But uh, this is the general overview. Uh, specific to SIG docs, we have several, not several, uh, at this point it's just two, but we plan to introduce a couple more by the end of this year. Uh, hopefully you know, burnout and everything else taken into consideration. Um, so first up, we have a PR Wrangler role, uh, which sits in between, I think, the uh, tech lead role or the co-chair role and also the approver role, um, approver and reviewer role. The reason that is the case is, um, if you look at the K website repository today, we have over 750 issues reported with the documentation. And uh, it's it's only going to increase every day because that's written by a human. Uh, and humans, as we all know, are prone to failure. We are at some point going to make a mistake. So we rely on our community to actually help us improve and help us keep the documentation as up-to-date and as relevant as possible. So um, with the incoming uh, requests that we get uh, with the various issues that we tag, there are, you know, pull requests open and we need a, a Wrangler uh, to actually help us review and approve those issues. We have reviewers and approvers formally, of course, uh, and those reviewers and approvers take weekly shifts uh, throughout uh, the year and we have a schedule up so that you can contact that person if your pull request needs to be merged or you know you need a second pair of eyes to take look uh, to take a look at it and see if everything is in order so we have that role for uh, PR Wrangler role for that purpose and uh, the issue Wrangler role is main, mainly more concerned with the number of issues that we have uh, which I said is around 750 I'm pretty sure it's increased by now I hope it has not for the sake of my sanity Okay, that's decreased. So this is really good news uh, that I get on this stage. But uh, 693 issues and uh, uh, it, it increases, decreases, it fluctuates. And we need people to help us uh, put those labels um, to the issues. We want to make it more diverse. We want to make our community more diverse and welcoming. So having those labels appropriate and uh, appropriate to the issue actually helps in attracting contributors. So 
that's why we formalized this role last year and uh, we're planning to introduce a couple of more roles uh, so that people are easily able to uh, see a gradual progression and not like a steep jump from zero to 100 uh, when it comes to your uh, contributor journey in the uh, SIG docs ladder. Now, uh, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of ways to become a contributor. Um, and this tree outlines them all. This is not a tree, actually. This is a, uh, <laughs> this is a road. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, essentially, we are in need of help in a lot of areas. And we have been constantly advocating for it. Uh, I'm aware uh, that you know we're running out of time. But this is a good way to get started. And uh, if you're interested, please ping us on SIG Doc Slack. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so I will have to pause here, but we're ready to take any questions or in the hallway track if you're interested. Thank you so much for attending this. It's been a real pleasure talking to you guys, and this is the largest attendance we've got. So I'm not kidding that I'm really pleased to see this attendance in Paris, especially in Paris today. Thank you so much. And we love new contributors. Oh, well. also, all of this is there. Uh, so uh, this is all information regarding the SIG uh, uh, that we just spoke about. You can scan the QR code directly if you're not interested in reading the slide. And uh, the slide will also be available on Shed. Uh, and lastly, please submit feedback. Uh, and please attend the next KubeCon uh, talk, too, if it's possible. <laughs> Thank you.